publicity. Yeah. Okay, now there is a recording of the session. So I will welcome again Professor Anna Volish for having accepted our invitation to be the second keynote uh, speaker of the, of the conference. It's a really great pleasure because also the, over the years, Adam has contributed a lot to the success, success of WOMOM. He made all the discussion of the panels, the keynotes, very live and interesting. So I'm very happy that he is here today to share his visions about the past, the present, the future of communications. Before starting, let please uh, say a few words about uh, Adam. So Prof Professor Adam Wallish is now research fellow at the Einstein Center of Digital Future, where he's a mentor to professors, helping them to develop their research visions. Over the last almost 40 years, Professor Wallish worked as a research director in several organizations. He was the head of the research laboratory at the Institute of Theoretical and Applied Informatics of the Polish Academy of Science from 1978 to 1989. He also was uh, leading a research activity at the Research Institute for Open Communication Systems of the German National Research Center for Computer Science from 1990 to 1993. Then from 1993 to 2018, he was a chaired professor of electrical engineering and computer science at Technical University of Berlin, where he has established and has been leading until 2018, the Telecommunication Networks Group. In the period 2001-2018, he has been Executive Director of the Institute for Telecommunication System. Since 2000, he has maintained an active cooperation with UCF Berkeley, including more than 12 years as adjunct professor. His research interests include the communication, network architectures and protocols, as well as protocol engineering. And the more recently, sensor networks and cognitive cooperative wild system. He also co-authored more than 200 research papers on these topics and coordinated several European and national projects and made a lot of achievements in our community. So I'm very happy that today he can deliver the talk to us with the entitled The Coexistence of Collaboration and Transparency in Radio Communication Systems. So Adam, I will uh, uh, end over to you. The floor is yours. You have uh, about 50 minutes for your talk. And then we will have uh, uh, 20 minutes of discussions at the end. Just a, a, a small announcement after the keynote, we will have also the announcement of the uh, WOMO 2020, uh, 2022 edition. And we will have a very small uh, announcement uh, from the general uh, chair of the conference for next year. So Adam, please. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you a lot, uh, Rafaela, for this uh, friendly introduction. And uh, please note that I'm starting like six minutes later. So I take the time at the end uh, to uh, go through uh, the ideas. Uh, obviously, the whole development of the ideas was not uh, entirely in isolation. I would like to acknowledge the uh, uh, numerous discussions and joint work with colleagues from the TU Berlin, specifically Dr. Anatoly Zubov and Piotr Gabovich, uh, who is on the call here in the session, as I've seen, and a couple of others, and also discussions with uh, several colleagues, both faculty and PhD students at UC Berkeley and project partners. So uh, talking about uh, the radio communication systems, I would like to focus mainly on the networking aspect. And uh, let's uh, be sure we have the common understanding of that. Uh, so in contrast to uh, say information theory, which looked, uh, looks uh, frequently in very abstract way, networking implies cooperation among the partners. You need some common set of protocol rules, which usually are known upfront, pre-programmed, you exchange control information called usually signaling uh, to exchange information and adapt to the changing situation. And in radio communication networks, we additionally have also acquisition of knowledge via joint observation. And uh, that is very important. The three aspects I'll, I'll refer to them the knowledge which is preset, the knowledge you obtain by sig via signaling, and the knowledge you obtain by observation. 
And obviously, networking means also that you are subject to infrastructure limitations, technical, organizational, who is managing which part, and we'll see that that's also very important. Now, uh, let me very shortly give the definitions of the notions which are in the title. Coexistence is uh, will be understood here as operating at the same time and in the same place in common frequency. Cooperation is working together for an agreed benefit, and that's very important. That has to be completely shared benefit, or part of the benefit might be uh, shared and part might be individual. And transparency is visibility of information beyond the intentionally transmitted content or beyond the intentionally selected set of recipients. And we will see that this is in radio communication specifically important. Now, let me quickly have a look back in the history of radio communication systems, uh, because we'll see that many of the issues which popped up in the very early days are very relevant conceptually today. So yeah, we have the first radio telegraphy and transatlantic transmission. And then people understood very quickly that they have to agree on some common rules. And, but uh, surprisingly, the first international conventions have not been devoted to sharing of spectrum and dividing of spectrum. That was about cooperation. First was cooperate about cooperative usage of infrastructure in the sense that stations belonging to an operator X should cooperate with stations belonging to operator Y in passing the information. The background was that the Marconi uh, company built a lot of stations and didn't want to pass information transmitted by others further beyond obviously emergency situations. And that was an issue because uh, now, if you look at that, you will see uh, analogies to now discussion uh, about which we'll be talking later, like national roaming and whatever. Now, the second was about cooperation even larger. Now people understood that if you are transmitting on joint frequencies and otherwise it's probably difficult to find each other, then you need some rules. And ship in distress uh, was allowed to take control over radio communication in the area. And also priority for transmissions of weather and time signals have been assigned. So very interesting way of cooperating together. And uh, yes, then broadcasting popped up. And yes, the first regulation about frequencies uh, has been brought. Now, the transparency we will see is extremely important to radio communication. Obviously, the transmission is visible by everybody, and if not encrypted, everybody can uh, receive it. Uh, now, interestingly enough, a few years after the first transmission, the first patent for transmitter location has been uh, filed and approved. And now all the location services have very, very old wood. Then, an uh, interesting application was identification of transmitting radio telegraphy operator by keystroke pattern. So if you like, it was human driven artificial intelligence. Yeah, you had pattern matching. And then a uh, very interesting issue during the Second World War, it was detecting the wavelength on which the reception, reception took place because they wanted to find out the spice in UK. And they knew pretty much which wavelength is used by uh, enemies transmitters and wanted to find them out. And yes, then again, what we would do today with uh, artificial intelligence machine learning, identification of transmitter importance in military application by the transmission power and amount of data. So analysis of the kind of data flow. So all the concepts are very, uh, up to date now, but they are very old. And now, yes, it then came uh, applications beyond broadcasting, not so important. Uh, important step was 68 FCC commits to support 
mobile telephony and assign some frequencies to them, and 91, the first GS GSM goes. Now, radio networks for data communications started essentially somewhere very early as a ra not radio, but networking concept. And then the first radio network, the Aloha, was just two years after the DARPA net kicked off. So immediately radio started. And Aloha was a breakthrough in many perspectives. Namely, for the first time, the concept of shared medium, medium has really been exploited. And if we look at the design, there are three simple rules, no observation at all, and minimum signaling, just acknowledgement, nothing more. And that delivered, as we know, and we teach very low efficiency. And the all improvements, both in the direction of the further protocols like WLAN, like whatever, or in improving ALOA itself, that was steps toward either more observation, like channel load, listen before talk, so using the transparency concept, or information exchange, like new ideas for improving ALOA and transmitting with packets some seniority of the packets or token passing or whatever we could do that just message passing to keep the cooperation running. Okay, and then came the ISM band and the era of pre and then wireless lens, which are now so important that we will talk about. Okay, so much history. Now let's summarize that with the basic challenges from radio networks, and we'll talk about some of them. So first is the question, is radio just the worst cable? We have fading, we have interference. So can it at all be somehow reasonably used to challenging applications? I'll talk shortly about that. We have different traffic requirements, which led to heterogeneous nets. And interestingly enough, we have a quite a variety of solutions, which did not disappear, but are quite well established. And the, that's specific reasons. Obviously, if you go to radio communication, you use a lot of mobile devices. So you are battery limited, you look at that. And obviously, there is the shared medium, which you would like to use very scarcely. So that is the reason that we have the diversity. And obviously, we have also another approach. And the other approach is putting everything on a single system, which somehow will be flexible enough uh, by, say, like concept of slicing to serve whatever needs you might have. And that is the old dream. We have that in wired communication. We have that now again in the wireless. But nevertheless, even if you do so, some issues of resource sharing remain very similar. We will talk a little bit about that. And additionally, what we have here is the existence of different operators and a lot of mini operators. And it's expected that the number of the mini operators will increase. Today, mini operator, uh, well, each of us is kind of mini operator of the WLAN at home. We'll talk about that. But in addition to that, we'll have uh, like companies, uh, verticals, which will deploy locally managed stations. So now let's go very quickly into the reliability and short delay in wireless. I remember very well that when we started talking about that in 90s, we talked to some of the industry companies uh, involved in manufacturing uh, in manufacturing the manufacturing equipment and equipping the manufacturing factories. And they kicked us out uh, with the pure idea of using radio. Well, why? Uh, all the reasons, the fading, uh, interference. Now, uh, what? Uh, where are we today? Uh, there's a lot of work in this area using diversity in frequency, in time, in space. Uh, one of the concepts which seems now to be dominating in the real uh, world is cooperative message delivery by different nodes, so distributed cooperative delivery. Uh, 
if you imagine a group of nodes uh, in radio reach, in radio coverage, then you transmit something. Um, some of others will receive it, not necessarily the intended recipient. And all who received could uh, work as the relays and probably synchronously uh, transmit it further with the all amplification due to that and assure reaching it. So theoretical analysis, uh, I, I will refer from time to time to, to papers and references was done in recent work in Berkeley and published. Uh, interestingly enough, independently of that, a product is now available from Berlin. Uh, I have to, to do some advertising. I'm not involved there, but my previous students have been the founders of the company and I hope they will be successful. Okay, now, uh, what we still have is the problem of jamming. And obviously crude jamming is an issue. Uh, yes, frequency diversity, the old concept of frequency hoppers from the Second World War, uh, that is still the defense to some extent. And, but uh, now we are further. There is a possibility for intelligent jamming. And for example, uh, it has been proven that even such quick hopper as Bluetooth can be followed by USLP equipment and uh, killed very selectively. Some control packets could be killed very selectively in spite of unknown sequence of, of jumping. So there is an issue. Uh, what can we do uh, against that at the moment? Essentially, we can use transparency. And uh, yes, we could detect the adverse behavior and diagnose it. But uh, we can try to localize the jammer. And uh, it was discussed in the previous keynote by Thomas Melodia. Uh, we have already methods for uh, recognizing a fingerprint of a transmitter. So we could kind of give a proof of ownership of the jammer. However, there have been recently new papers showing that mimicking is also possible. So let's see how the situation develops. OK, now let's go to multiple networks overlapping in joint frequencies. And yes, we have the interference. And the first idea a long, long ago was just power increase. And that leads, obviously, to the well-known tra tragedy of commons. Everybody increases the power. Everybody uh, jams more or, or uh, interferes more with others, and everything collapses. No pun. So uh, mo most of the networks which we have today are uh, coexisting by design. So again, we have design mechanism, like listen before talk, like duty cycling, and obviously power limitations, which is occasionally, for example, in the uh, uh, unlicensed bands, uh, very, very strictly limited. Uh, nevertheless, in spite of these coexistence mechanisms, the pairwise studies demonstrate very adverse impact. And that means that uh, we can use capacity much below the real fair sharing and best organized conceptually, imaginable best sharing. We have very unfair capacity sharing. And that happens even among networks with equal technology. We'll talk about that. And there are multiple reasons for uh, just to mention two, uh, for example, for listen before talk, uh, frequently it's overseen that different solutions have different sensitivity thresholds, which immediately brings unfairness. And uh, yes, some designs are much more robust than just the power would indicate like Bluetooth. Okay. So uh, now, uh, what is being done today? There is kind of like uh, front of the of the research. Uh, that is a lot on physical layer. People try to use signal processing to kind of pseudo orthogonalize the signal via signal processing, meaning that you could indeed, in parallel, transmit from two different technologies and uh, be able to separate the signals and allow them quasi to work completely parallel in the frequencies. Very interesting development. Usually to do that, you have first to uh, 
well recognized, and machine learning is helpful here, uh, what is the technology of your competitor, and then uh, try to use one of these approaches, which, yes, with programmable radio, with uh, uh, flexibility in that, might be useful some time. OK. Uh, the other approach is adaptivity for better coexistence, and that is uh, frequently used blacklisting of uh, interfield part of spectrum, so trying to, to not use that, moving to least loaded channels, obviously, and trying to adopt own behavior to the leader in the field uh, that, like LTU, is trying in some solutions to adopt to the usage by Wi-Fi. Okay. And finally, another uh, option, which I will mention very shortly, that is secondary usage with sensing. So a hierarchy of usage of the spectrum and uh, giving uh, some licensed user or out of any, some reasons prioritized users <coughs> the preference. And then uh, trying to make secondary users uh, work in a non-destructive way. How can we do that? Uh, there's a lot of research. There's sensing the transmitter activity. Uh, but it was proven, and that's a seminal paper by Anand Sahai and his students, Tambra, uh, that we have limits of that. So uh, you cannot really reliably do that with a single uh, receiver under many circumstances. Uh, by the way, also another very interesting work coming back to the ideas from the Second World War is uh, saying, well, I don't really need to know whether the transmitter is active. If nobody is receiving in my area, so why should I care? Uh, specifically for, for the wide spaces. And yes, there are technologies which make that possible, again, in limited uh, kind of environment. So low power secondaries could work. All in all, we usually need some cooperation in the sensing or cooperation with the primaries and sensors via the database for that. OK, now having given this kind of general overview, I would like to focus on what we need really for cooperation and go into some actual cooperation patterns and discuss them also looking in the future options. So what do we need? We need first to cooperate, decide what is the set of entities to cooperate with. And this question is very frequently neglected. If you look at the most of the papers, they assume we have a set of transmitters, receivers, participants, and we do something within the set. Now, in the radio, it's very difficult to define a set. So if you think in terms of multiple radio transmitters, each of them has neighbors, and the other ones has other neighbors, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, that's why in the cellular networks, you have an operator having an overall view and planning in a big scale. Now, here, obviously, there are methods where you try to find uh, loser coupling versus stronger coupling, but that's always an issue. And I wanted to mention that because it's very frequently neglected. Now, the other issue is establishing the information exchange, and we'll see that's not trivial. How do you establish a channel to talk to the other guy and cooperate? Obviously, we need a common goal and have to decide about that. And that will be the final part of my talk. I will not talk about uh, the algorithm to achieve the common goals and execution platforms that is out of the scope of this uh, discussion. OK, so now in order to focus on and justify my focus in the next slides, I just cite some predictions. So uh, we uh, have actual multiple sources who claim that 70 to 80 percent of data traffic is generated and accepted indoors. Yes, looks uh, plausible. Uh, we have a lot of home internet access, and the estimates are that 60, 70 percent of the households will be connected. And uh, yeah, we have a huge share, roughly estimated half, 
of the internet traffic coming as mobile traffic, meaning from mobile devices, not necessarily over cellular networks, made the difference. But most of the mobile traffic is generated today by smartphones. They might be connected via cellular, they mostly are connected over Wi-Fi, but that's a different story. They are coming from, smart, from smartphones and that's important, and that will be important for other, other discussions. So let's look at the home and very shortly think about some uh, today's problems and how they are being solved and how they could be solved. And then we'll move to the wider perspective. So uh, if you have an apartment house, we will have a couple of independent operators. That's very interesting. Each of them has the access point and they might uh, obviously belong uh, to uh, be connected by a completely different providers. In Germany, that might be uh, Vodafone, that might be Telecom, that might be somebody else. And uh, obviously the settings are under control mostly of the user, individual user. And they do not really cooperate. So now what is one of the oldest problems? Uh, there is, yes, interference and overlapping channels and harassing each other. As long as you are on single channel, you can share the capacity with some limitations we know, with inefficiencies we know, but somehow. If you are overlapping, that is very, very bad. Now, you could say, look here, that is a picture from 2.4 gigahertz, older, taken in my home, by the way. Who cares? Well, we do. So there was the hope that we go to 5 gigahertz, uh, it will uh, solve the problem. But suddenly, we went to 80 megahertz channels, 40, 80 megahertz channels. Well, we don't have so many of them. Now, the hope was 6 gigahertz will help. Well, well, well. If you go to 160 and intended with Wi-Fi 7, 320 megahertz, not really. So what happens? Well, people try to develop strategies for channel usage, huge research area. And by the way, it's a very interesting question, which is uh, the court is still out to some extent. Uh, should you use white channels on low power or nar narrow channels on high power? And there are controversial, interesting research results on that. And uh, then it comes not uh, obviously to the question how to select a wider channel. Usually at the moment in Wi-Fi, you take the basic channel and then try to find add-on channels as they are available. Very interesting concept popped up now in Wi-Fi 6, and that is the coloring of the channels. And just let me uh, put it into the context in very few sentences. So what is the idea of coloring? It's essentially the old military idea to discriminate friend or foe. So uh, each base station will uh, transmit a unique in the vicinity code for the basic service sets. So base station at the client over, uh, around them. And then the stations belonging to a given basic service set will know we are listening to other uh, messages, could decide other from participant in my BSS or other from a different BSS. If they are from my BSS, the concept is to use different sensitivity on listen before talk than for the other ones. Uh, what, what is the, the background of that? The hope is that if you have a decodable but signal coming from other basic service set, it might be weaker and you might transmit in parallel and use the capturing effect. As simple as that. It's additional plays are possible. Strategies are not defined, only the mechanism. So yes, let's see. There will be very interesting idea how we can use that. But I would like to talk about the alternative idea, uh, which we have also studied. And that is the question, could you do something locally by just cooperation on top of all the standard life mechanisms? And the problem is that if you are in such apartment building and you have the overlapping channels like previously, 
you have only mysterious SSIDs being uh, transmitted, and you have no clue who is Bob, whose Wi-Fi is sending a, a very cryptic SID. And you are unlikely to knock all the doors and ask, are you Bob? And do you use the Wi-Fi? And could you please go to another channel? No way you can do that. So the one possible method which we have studied is trying to establish a connectivity channel for possible cooperation. And how you can do that? You can do it very simply. You could send a probe request from Alice Wi-Fi, including an information which is very critical, namely public IP address of a management unit of Alice Wi-Fi. So I announce, how could you reach me over the open internet? And additionally, we could add some security credentials for the future communication. Now, Bob's station can issue prompt response, including his public IP address for over the internet and security credentials for opening the channel. And as a result, we can now establish a channel over the public internet, not over the air, and start negotiation and cooperation on channels, on whatever pattern. We have the channel here, and we can communicate. OK, let's use that for something for somehow different scenario. The somehow different scenario is devoted to, again, apartment house. And very uh, frequent story, uh, Alice has her Wi-Fi router here and is in some corner and has weak connectivity. Same for Bob, and they are unhappy. Uh, let's remember that if we have weak signal strength, that's not only Alice and Bob are unhappy, but the efficiency of the communication is decreasing. Because if we go to low signal, that means we use lower modulation and coding. That means we decrease massively the bit rate. Here in this case, if we change between those levels of signal, we go to one third of the original bit rate, meaning each message needs three times as much time to go through the air. So we lose capacity. That is the big deal. So what could we do? Obviously, the idea would be if Bob could connect to Alice Wi-Fi and Alice to Bob's Wi-Fi, then not only they will be happy, but in addition, there is much more capacity for other devices used bo both by Bob here in his apartment and Alice here and here. So it's a game. It's a netto game. Besides of that, yes, we'll uh, talk about that later. This could be completely out of coverage, but let's put it aside for a moment. OK, so now uh, we have that. And we can have high throughput for Bob and high throughput for Alice. Uh, how it has been done, uh, there is a specific published solution. And essentially, uh, one could, using the channel established previously over the public internet, uh, deploy at the access points, virtual access points belonging to the partner. And it's interesting. The whole traffic is going via the wired internet in encrypted form. And the virtual access point issues from the router of my neighbor, the my PSSD and my credential and my security login. So I have two big benefits. I don't have to disclose my security settings to my neighbor. And because I'm using his access point to tunnel the traffic to my access point, I have full retaining full control over possible IoT devices and other devices 
to which are connected. And uh, yes, this concept could be uh, recursively used. So I could do that with first neighbor, second neighbor, and uh, extend the range, obviously with very slow moving device. Uh, yes, what we need here is obviously some capacity slicer at the visited router. We didn't want to overload the visited, visited uh, access point with neighbor's traffic. Now, is that just playing with toys? No, if we look at the newest announcement last week, whatever made the big headlines was Amazon Sidewalk. And what is Amazon Sidewalk? That an that comes from the very similar problem. Appliances like doorbell, like whatever, a complain about wrong coverage and weak signal or loss of coverage if they are in your courtyard, in your garden, wherever. So the idea is you could use the connectivity to a gateway, so like Amazon Echo, in neighbor's home, and then his Wi-Fi connection to connect to controller in your house. And the difference here is that obviously they are using Amazon Cloud to, to, uh, and cloud services to coordinate that, but again, encrypted channel, covered uh, traffic, and again, limited uh, usage of the bandwidth at the visited neighbor. So uh, these issues are very important. Now I'll speed up because the time is running. And uh, let me see, uh, have, uh, mention that the same problem uh, exists in heterogeneous environment. We will not have only Wi-Fi. We'll have, for example, like LTE uh, installed at homes. Uh, providers, operators claim that will become more and more frequent. We don't know. And uh, yes, uh, there is the open question of the cross-technology communication, very hot topic nowadays. How could you communicate and do the same what we did previously uh, across different uh, communication standards? So one issue is emulation of the target signaling using the native radio. Kind of tons of papers at the moment in last years. An interesting alternative is using the power energy modulation. Essentially pioneered in 2009 by Chevrolet uh, by in a seminal paper uh, with just presenting the concept. And nowadays it could be advanced very uh, far, uh, just to mention a paper which was best paper award last year on the OMOM, uh, and I will not uh, discuss the details, you can look up in the proceedings. So now cooperation between the uh, heterogeneous is possible. Now, how do operators see the cooperation among the, say, LTE and Wi-Fi, because they claim that will be now a big deal. Uh, that is a picture taken from the working document draft standard of the IPP project 1932.1, which is devoted to a cooperation license unlicensed spectrum for 5G. And the idea is to have a licensed and unlicensed controller. That is the, that is the big new box, which is embedded completely in the 5G architecture and which is connected to both uh, Wi-Fi uh, access points and IT stations, uh, openly or privately managed. And uh, they are getting a more huge amount of reports then can coordinate and organize everything. Big deal, we, let's see how it will be deployed. Okay, I jump over and uh, due to the lack of time, not comment about uh, YT and sensor networks, there are several solutions. I'll just drop it to, to a side. Now let's move to cooperation among public networks. And because we, we have been talking about Wi-Fi, that's not only Wi-Fi. So uh, here, uh, there is a very interesting story. Namely, we know, everybody knows that we have coverage, which is not unique by different uh, providers. And I try to show you uh, dynamically, if I can do it really quickly, then I try to show you something different. Uh, the, uh, oh yeah, I can try to do that and show you a map of Germany. And that's uh, uh, 
actually actual by April this year, publicly available, when you can look at the coverage of different technologies and I can select the technology and say 4G, and then I can select the operator. And if you look here, uh, Telefonica in this case, it's official, it's public, so I can use the names, uh, has uh, a lot of holes, but uh, the others also have a lot of holes. Now, if you look at all together, there's much less. So uh, here comes the question. Is that a good idea that they are still avoiding the uh, possibility to give the uh, exchange to do the national roaming? And by the way, uh, all those studies from Sweden showing that independent of coverage, also the strength and, uh, of the signal is obviously completely different and not uniform across different uh, providers in a given place. So you have the leader and it might be again beneficial. Now, is that true? There is a very nice uh, recent work uh, two years ago uh, coming from a Toronto group, which uh, shows that indeed the same phenomenon which we had previously uh, also pertains to the public network. If you have a low signal quality, that means that your transmission is slow. That means that you block much more capacity. Now, operators very frequently have been using the argument that uh, they use more and more uh, common towers. So what the heck? That doesn't make a difference. So what the people from Toronto showed that even in case of joint tower usage, if only the antenna are not identically positioned, which they usually are not, you can benefit from using the strongest signal. And it, that is another argument that the uh, national roaming might make sense. OK. Now, let's go to the goals. And that is the last big part of my talk. I've talked about mechanism. I've talked about some goals, like joint usage of the infrastructure to improve the capacity. But now it's a further steps which are of importance. Let's just look at Wi-Fi. Let's look at Wi-Fi. And uh, again, if we have a, even a single station and some of the stations are slower than the others due to weak signal, then obviously we have a problem. And the problem is that we lose capacity. So we have in Wi-Fi the so-called packet level fairness, but it does not mean that it's throughput level fairness. And yes, there are studies which show that we could do that in very recent work, which we have uh, been doing with uh, Jean Valjean and Berkeley, uh, that uh, can be demonstrated that uh, theoretical results about uh, his new development convergence of distributed kiefer wolfowitz algorithm allow distributed optimization. So by observing the joint throughput, if you can observe it completely, or by messaging, get the information how much throughput the others get, then you could optimize the operation of the system in sense of fair sharing. But is really fair sharing the goal? So now let's look at that and what is fair sharing and fair sharing of what it really matters. But before that, let's have a look at the today's infrastructure. So we have the split content provider and communication infrastructure operators. And their relation is full of tension. The content provision generates money. Capacity provision causes causes cost. So there is completely div divergent view on the whole story. And each of those partners play own game. Today, applications are agnostic of the issues of the infrastructure and attempt to adopt to changing delivery conditions. A lot of work. The infrastructure operators 
misses real information about the application and the needs. Uh, application might care about the efficient usage of infrastructure or not. And the infrastructure operator might try to do machine learning or whatever to learn something about the usage and cooperation. All in all, highly inefficient story. So what is the current vision of the holy world? Well, uh, many people think we should go. Uh, the idea is application shared the requirements, so quality of service specification. And yes, we'll need some specific internet, uh, specific interfaces. And uh, there are some first uh, suggestions how the interface could look like to give more information and more uh, uh, develop more sophisticated description. Now, operators could support them by resource partitioning. So slicing is the big word. We have heard that in the previous uh, keynote. And uh, yes, subject to limitation in spectrum, limitation in infrastructure, also uh, backhaul and backbone, and user location, possible user mobility, which they can measure on their level. Now, uh, yes, the hope is, thanks to clever algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that, everybody will be happy. But first of all, the flexibility doesn't come for free. And there is a very nice recent work, uh, Infocom 21, showing the cost of flexibility. So all the slicing of that, there will be additional cost for the infrastructure providers who anyway are carrying the burden. Now, we have to look at the back hole. In, if we speak again from the perspective of homes, and I have emphasized the uh, importance of homes. Uh, well, there is the offered DSL speed today in Germany. And that is the measured speed in last years. Real. Yes, some of that was measured also from device connected by Wi-Fi. So it's not only the fixed broadband which we have, but we see that the limitations are not negligible as the average. So that also has to be taken into account. Now, let's focus uh, on the real requirements. Eventually, people do really care about the experience from the application. And there have been, again, much of, many studies and very good arguments, Columbia University in this case, that quality of experience is the real goal. Obviously it is. Any translation is difficult, we will talk about that. So essentially, we should optimize on some notion of fairness, whatever notion of fairness we take, on the level of quality of experience, not quality of service. And obviously do quality of experience level of scalability. Now, quality of experience evaluation is complex. Usually it's done by user opinion scores, just questionnaires, so ex post, we don't have it online. Now, translation of the level of satisfaction into quality of service, wow, tons of studies, not very many results. Usually, the idea of the content provider is to translate it in the secure way, which means over provisioning and not under provisioning, because the user will be unhappy. And now let us look at some examples showing that the whole story is not so simple. So video adaptation example, that was a very nice recent paper showing that it's the issue which is important to the user changes not due to the type of transmission, it's both video watching, but the goal. And if you just watch video, then the, you can reduce the resolution, but the framework rate should remain. If you do like face detection from the video or other detection, then the resolution is crucial and the rate doesn't matter. So uh, if you only know as provider that it's video watching and you don't know what is being done with that, you are in trouble. 
Another issue that was best paper award, MobileCompete uh, 15, uh, shows that essentially on smartphones, and again, smartphones are the uh, most used device, uh, we have now a competition on graphics, better and better graphics. But if you dependent on how far you keep your uh, phone from your face, uh, the resolution might not be needed. If you go a little bit farther, so the result on the older uh, Samsung Galaxy S5 was that the, the uh, graphic available at that time uh, was uh, overkill if you keep the, that type of phone uh, like 13 centimeters from your nose, which well, you easily uh, go farther than that. And that could show that, yes, uh, you could reduce the uh, pixel number, the resolution, without any change of experience. Now, think in terms of a TV set, when you switch it on at home and use the streaming over internet and Wi-Fi, uh, and then uh, you go to your kitchen and only look from a side through the doors and look at the other scenario. Uh, watching TV is the most common press sleep activity. If you have, again, wirelessly connected TV set and you go to sleep and it's running further, it's using the bandwidth. So uh, now we're looking at completely new uh, scenarios for application, immersive media experience, virtual reality, and similar stuff. Uh, there is a beautiful, very recent uh, white paper available on the internet assessment of immersive media experience. And what they say the authors, very prominent, high set of internationally uh, appreciated researchers in quality of experience research. They claim that the subjective assessment, just the asking people, will be important, but a little bit. What really is important is behavioral assessment. Do people move? Do people do something? What is the context? And then comes something very interesting, usage of psychophysiological methods. How is the emotional situation of the recipient of the information or participant in the communication? Well, that's a challenge, right? Do we have an answer? Well, there are some approaches from the application over the top services providers to assess something like that, not much. But what is really fascinating, we have now a new dimension of transparency on the networking radio communication level. Since a couple of years, roughly 2003, uh, first work in this, uh, 2013, sorry, first uh, MIT work, Dina Katabi, who is pioneering that, uh, the discovery that if you act as human in the electromagnetic field caused by all the radiation around you, then the changes in the field could be detected, processed, and lead to recognition of a lot of artifacts. And uh, there is a big, good survey of these methods, uh, very recent. And what can be essentially done, bottom, bottom line? You can detect presence of people in the room. You can count them. You can classify the activities, moving, sitting, lead, reading, talking. You can follow micro activities, lips, keystroke, brazing, pulse. You can follow the movement gesture, posture, you can identify individuals, you can do a lot. Uh, and if I can show you a very short video from Dina Katabi, I think I have five minutes more, I would like to use them. Let me go to the, um, do I have that, do I have that, that is it sharing. So have a look what is possible. 
just looking across the world and deriving the skeleton movements, the pattern of movements, the posture. And that's possible not only for a single person, but we'll see in a moment that you can also see that also for several people. So uh, you can imagine that if you have all the movements, you know the context, you know what the human being is doing, you know who is doing what, a lot of interesting information. Okay, let's stop that and come back to uh, my presentation and the discussion of our uh, issues. Uh, okay. I think I can uh, share that. Uh, just a moment. That is the. Uh, well, I am here. Uh, yeah. Got it. Okay. So, what can we do? What can we indeed do uh, with that uh, beautiful new technology? Well, we can do a lot. Uh, we can go one step further. And that's again, uh, MIT Katabi group, but others follow. We can do even emotion recognition. And there are basic seven human emotions. And they developed a technology, yes, going beyond Wi-Fi, but in the usual spectrum. And using the well-known uh, chirping radio, and then you can do uh, brazing and heart rhythms recognition and derive out of that the emotion. Now, imagine there are also other pieces of work showing how brazing, how heart rhythms could be recognized. And if you add to that recognition of body gestures, if you are kind of unhappy, you move, uh, you act, then there's huge potential for emotion recognition. Now, let us summarize what can that do and what can your home router or more home gateway do with that? Then can follow the quality of experience in real time uh, just by analysis of the Wi-Fi uh, electromagnetic fields or some additional which uh, the access point could be equipped in. I don't, don't, don't want to go into details at the moment. You can obviously, knowing the quality of experience, adjust the connectivity, negotiate the wireless resources, select the backhaul, possibly combine uh, like uh, DSL and uh, 4G or 5G, uh, in, uh, observe the impact of connectivity on quality of experience, what really matters to the user, and predict user action, even that. So a huge potential. Now, having that, you can redefine the position of the networking provider. You can use the information in spirit of the future internet. And it's, there is a very interesting recent paper from leading researchers in the internet community all over US and beyond advocating that we have to think about putting additional services on top of the IP forwarding on the edges of the internet in the point of presence or even in the base station access point. So if we have these capabilities of looking at the user at the edge, that is a huge potential to fit into this architecture. And the networking providers get information which is not available to the over-the-top providers and get completely different position in bargaining with them. They become now partners if they have it. And obviously, they can assure trusted processing in the information at home. The probably last slide, uh, yes, the gateway could also help you. There is the risk that the electromagnetic field can be also used and analyzed by somebody staying in front of your building or in front of your home. 
that has been proven it's possible on a smartphone, just listening to Wi-Fi. The more Wi-Fi equipment you have at home, the easier it is for the intruder to understand it. So uh, your access point could try to help you in uh, distorting that. Very interesting open issue. And yes, to summarize that, I hope I have shown you the path to go toward a new understanding, Co using the cooperation to um, satisfy user expectation, the quality of experience in a most efficient way. And if you look at the formula here, it's saying essentially that, that the goal should be limit the spectrum used to the minimum, which is essential to satisfy the services and users. And for that, the latest technical advances should be used. It's not my motto. It's from the constitution of the ITU. We probably have forgotten that such institution exists. But that is the real goal. Well, wireless remains fascinating. Thank you for your attention. Sorry if I took additional three minutes. And I am looking forward to questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Adam, for this very rich talk full of ideas and experience. Now let's open the floor for the question. Are there questions from the audience? Who wants to start? There is a question from uh, Claudio. Claudio. So, hi. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'll start with one uh, about the quality of service. Uh, I don't have uh, the, the same experience you have, of course, but still, uh, uh, already 20 years ago, I was already doing research on quality of service. So uh, after 20 years, I'm starting to wonder whether it's uh, a never-ending battle. If it, if it is something that we, we, we have to win or we can't win at all. So I remember uh, that the, my first project I was involved in with uh, Luciano Lenzini, whom uh, you, you know uh, and you remember, I suppose, was on end-to-end -end quality of service on IP network. So at the time, uh, it, was, it was like the future because uh, there was no uh, easy way to do real-time streaming like we are doing today. In 20 years, as far as I know, uh, in, the, in uh, the, uh, the network layer, nothing has been done. But still, we are doing this. So what, the, you know, your opinion, your opinion, what the effort was, or maybe we should have spent uh, our research efforts uh, uh, in some other manner? Thank you a lot. It's a great question. And uh, essentially, it helps me to formulate my message. I don't think we should fight for the quality of service and fulfilling this abstract notion, we need as managed by bandwidth, we need that, we need that, we need that. We need to keep the user happy. That is the issue. How do we keep the user happy? Well, you could uh, take the completely opposite way. You don't care how you keep him happy as long as you can do it. So you would like to do it efficiently. So you could try. You have somehow to deliver the bandwidth to the user. You can somehow, uh, and we have been living, as you said, many, many years with over-provisioning. The question is, how much do you over-provision? How could you, and if you have the progress of technology, if we can, for example, what, the, to, what is being done today to improve the quality? So frankly speaking, the over-the-top providers start deploying their own, partially own infrastructure. And what do they do? They have on the edges their services, and they try to go with as simple tunnel as possible, or even links uh, from the source to the destination. Select the proper source, select the proper, have the proper destination, uh, take a possibly separate path, and just avoid the whole burden of the network. Yeah, so that is the idea in the newest architecture. Do it very simple, do it very efficient, process at the edges. 
Okay, so uh, you can do a bit with selecting the provider, with selecting the passes. That's a play. I'm not believing in 20 categories of quality of service uh, separated by 20 types of application and uh, incredibly complex network supporting them. No. You will have admission control. You will look how many people you can have keep happy. And uh, that's it. Thanks. So, John? Adam, an excellent talk. And I'll first make a comment and then I'll ask the question, OK? So for the audience who may not be familiar, that Professor Adam Mulitz has been associated with Uwama for a long, long time. And the first time, actually, he was a program co-chair in 2001 when Uwama was still a workshop with SCM Mobicom. It was the fourth SCM Mobicom workshop held in Rome, Italy. And Adam and Victor Val from Microsoft were the program co-chairs. So he has been involved in many different capacities. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge uh, your contribution to OMOM. And after 20 years, of course, you're back again as a keynote speaker, which is wonderful. Thank you a lot. The real time. question I, yeah. <laughs> the real question I have is uh, if I think about beyond 5G, 6G, all this backhaul cellular network, right? Uh, currently, uh, even with millimeter wave technology or terahertz, you cannot get below 10 milliseconds, right? Uh, latency. But there are lots of different types of application and you had to several of them, uh, like digital twin, video games, AR, VR, all sorts of different applications, right? So when you have this heterogeneous network with a backhaul cellular network and with all this Wi-Fi, and billions of millions of IoT devices connected right in the edge. So question is, if you want to go below 10 millisecond latency, uh, do you have any thoughts that what kind of technology will evolve and deliver that? Because that seems a very challenging question. And there are a lot of applications where uh, I think up to one millisecond probably would be more appreciated than 10 milliseconds latency. So that's the first question. And uh, if there is time, I'll ask another question. Okay. So let me let me say what I think about. Yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical that making the whole architecture of 5, 6, 7, 11 G uh, more and more complex <clears throat> will really is the best way. I'm not saying it is not the way. Um, uh, you know, I'm too old to become unmodest and say something will <laughs> not work. I not do that done this mistake a couple of times in my life. So uh, yes, it might be a way to go and I wish all the best to those who try. Uh, I am personally a guy who is uh, in favor of simplicity. So first of all, if you are talking about delay, you have to take the background. What is the kind of uh, baseline? The baseline is the signal propagation. You cannot beat that. So obviously, uh, you have a limit how quickly you can go from Australia to Alaska or uh, wherever you, whatever distance you uh, take across the globe. And that is the baseline. Now, what are you putting on top of that is mainly the matter how much processing you do in between, right? That's very simple. If you put a fiber optic from A to B, you are a little bit above the baseline. We'll not put the fiber optic from A to B everywhere, it's clear. So I think that we'll have a, as efficient as possible local connectivity. And then we'll try to go as quickly as possible to a point of presence, which will have as few intermediate hops to your destination as possible. So that's why, and that I appreciate a lot, the research now in towards 6G goes much more than it used to be previously in fusing the view of wireless at the edge and fiber in the core. And that is, I think, the, the, real, the proper way to go. 
So, so Raffaele, is there any time for the second yeah, yeah, question? Yeah, there is time for the another other... question. So there is time, Sajana. There go is ahead. time? Yes. Okay. So the sec second question would be, Adam, that we are talking about, let's say, communication is a dense urban areas. That's a very congested area. And you are talking about even smart transportation where the cars communicating with the buildings or other cars with roadside units, all right. And your very small Pico cells or whatever, that's one on one side of it, right? But the second side, you had alluded a little bit about the game theory and all. So people are working on, but so economics at scale actually comes in the picture because it's not only just the capex, right? The infrastructure cost, but configuration management. How do you adapt with different situations dynamically in real time, right? And that cost has not been actually considered that much that, right? Operational cost, functional cost. Do you have anything on yeah. uh, to highlight yeah. on that? So in fact, uh, if I can go back, that is what I mentioned here, the cost of the, uh, oh, sorry, I have to, to look at my, that is the, the cost of the, uh, uh, no, where, where do I have it? It's the cost here of the flexibility. That is, um, uh, okay. And that is the flexibility cost. That's very new point of view. The Infocom paper coming from the Munich group of Wolfgang Kellerer, who I think, uh, as far as I know, for the first time looked at the flexibility cost. And it's absolutely correct. That is something which will be additional burden. And I mentioned that essentially providing the capacity is always cost. But yes, the more flexible infrastructure will create additional cost. So I can advise to look at this paper as probably first uh, input in this very, very important direction. Now, the second more global view from my perspective, and that's why I have been talking so much about Wi-Fi and whatever, is that I do not share the vision which is very popular, 5G or 6G will serve everything and every possible configuration of quality uh, expectation and everybody and forget all the other networks. In contrary, my vision, and that's why I mentioned how much we do from indoors, is forget the, let the mobility be served by mobile pro service providers. That's the primary role. And let's remove whatever is not mobile to what can be served by wireless, kind of fixed wireless, like Wi-Fi, like very local small LTE station. I don't care about technology. I'm not now fighting Wi-Fi against LTE or, or, or uh, new radio because they'll become more and more similar anyway on the physical layer. I'm fighting about very local, not mobile provision for those who are at the moment nomadic and not mobile and leave the capacity and the cost involved to, uh, with that, with real mobile applications, the vehicles, the drones, all that. So that I think is something which is a mindset and we have to go in this direction. I think we will. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you a lot for your wonderful talk. Uh, we can just give you a virtual applause for uh, your talk, for your uh, no, no more than this, unfortunately. <laughs> Let's hope to, to meet again in Italy in the near future. And uh, now uh, it's time for an announcement.